Hello everyone, welcome to The Empowering Neurologist. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Our interview today is really exciting. Truth be known, I've already done the interview and it was fantastic. We're going to speak with Dr. Sarah Hallberg. She is board certified in internal medicine, in obesity medicine, and also what we call clinical lipidology, which deals with blood lipids, things like cholesterol. She's also a registered exercise physiologist. She's the medical director and founder of the Medically Supervised Weight Loss Program at Indiana University. And she's also adjunct professor of clinical medicine at the Indiana University School of Medicine. She is also the medical director for Verta Health, a company that's working to improve the lives of patients with diabetes uh, through nutrition and other lifestyle modifications you know, using high levels of technology. Uh, this is a really, really great in, uh, interview lots of great take-home information for uh, treatment of diabetes and even preventing a diabetes. So let's just get right to it. So hello, Dr. Hallberg. Hello. How are you doing? I am doing well. Thank you for having me today. Delighted. So we spend a lot of time on this program talking about diabetes. Uh, you know, for me as a neurologist, we talk about it as sort of the gateway to so many neurological issues. And that's really why I wanted to reach out to you because you've really defined yourself as taking a position that while diabetes is treatable using uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, other forms of intervention, uh, that you seem to think that lifestyle issues play a really important role in treatment and certainly in prevention. Where do we begin that discussion? Well, I think um, we would begin with exactly what you said, treatment. And I'll actually say what I think pharmaceuticals do is that they manage disease, right? So management of type 2 diabetes with pharmaceutical agents only, really we know what that leads to. That leads to potentially delaying progression, but it certainly doesn't halt progression. So diabetes, once someone gets that diagnosis, specifically here I'm talking about type 2 diabetes, what we see is that they're stuck with this. They're stuck with this disease for the rest of their life, or at least that's what they're told. So they get type 2 diabetes, they're going to work really hard on taking their medications as they're supposed to, and maybe, just maybe, will slow down the disease, slow down some of the devastating consequences of the disease, such as blindness, limb amputation, cardiovascular diseases, strokes, but that's the best that we can hope for. But I flatly reject that. I think instead what we need to start talking about is actually disease reversal. And if we manage lifestyle factors appropriately, that's exactly what we can do. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to love this interview. This is terrific. <laughs> I, re I recall years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine was a study comparing uh, exercise and dietary uh, intervention versus metformin intervention in a group of pre-diabetics. And uh, the exercise and dietary intervention group was far less likely to convert to diabetes and the death rate in the metformin group was twice as high. So, you know, using that as a launch point, I'm really dialed in, especially when you called it a beast. So, um, you know, you're talking about these variables that we have control over, the food that we put in our mouth, the number of times we exercise, etc. What does the program look like? So, well, what I'd like to do is actually go back to the physiology really quick, if I could. Sure. Start with we this. have all the time explain in the world. Explain what we do and why it works. So one of the things that I like to say to patients at the beginning is, you know, my goal is not to hand you a food list of what you can eat. My, my job is to help you understand why certain things are better choices than others. And to do that appropriately means teaching people about nutrition and a little bit about human physiology. And I think that unfortunately in our busyness of, you know, primary care clinics, that often gets overlooked and it does become easier just to write a prescription. And so really quick, kind of just to discuss a little bit about why what we do works. What we have to understand is the physiology of what causes diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, I'm definitely talking about here. And it begins with insulin resistance. And insulin is our fat storage hormone. 
And so what happens to our fat storage hormone when we eat winds up becoming really important. If we're talking about weight gain, or of course, if we're talking about a disease like type two diabetes. And if we take a look at what happens with different foods and insulin levels, what we see is that when we consume carbohydrates, our insulin level goes up really fast. And with protein, it's less, although it still rises. And the really interesting thing is that fat does not essentially cause an insulin reaction at all. And that's why fat actually becomes a really important part of a science-based dietary recommendation. Because rising insulin levels, it is thought, is actually what likely begins the process of insulin resistance. So if we really want to deal with the root cause of type 2 diabetes, we want to go back to the root cause and deal with the insulin resistance. So if we're consuming less of what causes our insulin levels to rise, that seems right off the bat to make a lot of sense. We jump then to our normal treatment. Remember the normal management of type 2 diabetes, which is pharmaceuticals, often which just cause insulin levels to go up even more. So what we're essentially saying is that into a system that's resistant to insulin, my treatment, my management plan is just going to be shove more of what we're resistant to in it. And again, if we remember going back that insulin is our fat storage hormone, we can really see how this creates for patients a vicious cycle. Let me, let me hold you right there because I really yeah. want our viewers to get their arms around, if they can, uh, the notion of insulin. Everybody appreciates that insulin is the way our bodies deal with elevated blood sugar. But you brought up a really important point that insulin is telling the body basically winter is coming, make and store fat. Uh, if our viewers look back at the interview we did with Gary Taubes and with Dr. David Ludwig, see everybody's kind of coming around and saying the same thing that, uh, and we'll get back to diabetes in a moment, but the obesity issue is related to our stimulation of insulin in our bodies, uh, which happens because of our sugar and carbohydrate consumption. Correct. Correct. So let's again, get back then to, um, to where we are now. We're at a place where the drugs are actually, actually leading to higher levels of insulin, digging the hole deeper, uh, as opposed to let's reduce the insulin and how do we go about that? Yeah, so uh, let me explain it this way. One of the uh, ways that I really like to talk about this with my patients that I think hits home and helps them understand it is, is in some classes I'll ask them, you know, how much sugar is actually in your blood? And, you know, we know maybe that a blood sugar of less than 100 is considered normal. But you ask someone, what does that mean specifically? I mean, what is a blood sugar of 100? And actually, it's very interesting if you do the math on this. We have a lot of blood. I mean, we have five liters of blood on average in our system. And if someone thinks of a two liter of soda, I mean, that's a lot of blood. And actually, surprisingly, divide or dissolved in all of this, is about five grams of glucose or blood sugar. And that's actually only a teaspoon. In our system, in all of our circulation, we have all this blood and only a teaspoon of sugar. And we all understand and know that our body works really hard to keep that one teaspoon right where it is. So in other words, we don't jump from a blood sugar of 100 and then all of a sudden go to 1,000. I mean, our body works really hard to keep it at 100 or lower. So what happens after we eat, right? Let's take a good low-fat food, which we've been told is a good idea for us. Take a cup of rice, for example. A cup of rice people might think of as being a really good option because, number one, it's low-fat, right? We've been told that that was good for so long. And number two, it's actually reasonably low-calorie. I mean, a cup of rice only has about 200 calories. The problem for someone with diabetes especially or any form of insulin resistance, is that almost all of that 200 calories is carbohydrates, which means there's 50 grams, or 10 teaspoons, if we convert that, of sugar, that then comes into a system in a couple of minutes that's only actually got one teaspoon in it. Now, in a normally functioning system, in someone who is not insulin resistant, but unfortunately, there's very few of those people left as adults in this country any longer. Amazing. 
the system here is supposed to act by as the sugar's coming in from the rice, what we do is our insulin levels spike really fast and insulin essentially acts as a key that will unlock the doors to the cells in our body to allow the glucose to just go in. So in other words, we're able to keep that one teaspoon in our circulation just like our body wants it. The problem here with this system is that when someone becomes insulin resistant, what I like to explain it to patients like is that insulin is the key that opens those doors. And when we're resistant, the key doesn't fit. Our body is resistant to it. So because we're so, our body is so geared to keeping our levels at that teaspoon, its backup plan essentially is just keep making more keys. So we flood the system with keys, our insulin levels rise and they rise and they rise and eventually someone will get these doors open and we can pull that sugar from the diet and push it into the cells. And that works for a while. But two problems come about. Number one, we have these very high levels of our fat storage hormone around for years or even decades. This system will keep up. But the problem is when someone is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, on average, half of the cells that make insulin in their pancreas have actually died from overworking for so many years so that we can keep the blood sugar tightly regulated. And that's when diabetes starts. So again, going back to understanding it on a basic level like that, I mean, we are basically a slave to our human physiology. We can't escape that that's the way we work. And so in order to really, again, not manage, but deal with the root cause of diabetes, we've got to get those insulin levels down. And the way to do that is to restrict carbohydrates in our diet. Now, the important thing about restricting carbohydrates is that I didn't say restrict in general. It's restricting carbohydrates. Because one of the problems and one of the traps we've fallen into with our advice over the years is everything is eat less, exercise more. Eat less, exercise more. Calories and in, calories out. Calories in, calories out. And it's frustrating to patients because I want to, I want, to find the person who suffers from obesity or type 2 diabetes who hasn't already tried that. People are trying that, but they get very frustrated because, again, that advice doesn't hit home at the root of the problem. So we don't have to pound away at everybody, don't eat, don't eat, be hungry, but go out and exercise anyway. Instead, if we cannot have them obsessing and thinking about calories so much and instead just worry about decreasing the carbohydrates in the diet, this works and it works fast and people actually feel better. So really what we're seeing is then we're seeing this manifestation of a mismatch between the body that we have through an evolutionary perspective and the current environment in terms of the food choices that are available. I mean, this physiology as it relates to insulin and, and glucose management and lip lipogenesis, the production of fat, that's been working for a couple million years and then suddenly we bombard the system with this basically this poison and our bodies are just not equipped because we haven't evolved that rapidly enough to deal with uh, you know, with this sudden onslaught of, of sugar and, and carbohydrate. Yes, and I think that unfortunately, you know, if we dial that back and say, you know, when did this really start getting back? It's when we were told to put all the carbohydrates in our diet in this attempt to avoid fat. Yeah. So, you know, that was really kind of a heralding moment in our nation's health history. So if we were told we couldn't eat fat, I mean, people needed to eat something. And since there's only three macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, when we dialed back the fat, we really increased the carbohydrates. And unfortunately, they became easy to package carbohydrates. Sure. sure. And I think, you know, clearly we all now understand that it's out in the open. The reason we were told to cut back on fat and eat more carbs is you know, clearly there was industry influence in scientific publications that led 
the scientific and uh, uh, medical community to make that exact recommendation. And, you know, now the dirty little secret is out. Okay, don't have to point fingers, but let's, uh, you know, not curse the darkness and light that candle moving forward. And, and really what you're saying is lighting the candle and letting people know that what you're talking about is a risk reduction uh, diet for diabetes and perhaps even a way of intervening in somebody who has diabetes now to help get them better. That's right. That's right. So and I think that's something we need to talk about, right? So people, again, one of the most frustrating things to me is when I say type 2 diabetes can be reversed. And it's like this hushed secret. We don't want to say it. Why? We need to let people know that. Yeah, I tell people that to some degree Alzheimer's is reversible and you think type 2 diabetes raises eyebrows, you should see when we talk about Alzheimer's. But um, I, I agree with you that type 2 diabetes is clearly reversible. Many of us see and, and do that uh, quite frequently. But let's talk about how you make that happen with patients. So yes, so I have a clinic at Indiana University Health um, and we have been using carbohydrate restriction as a um, method for weight loss and more importantly for diabetes um, management slash reversal when we're talking about type 2 diabetes um, for many years. And we saw such stark results in our clinic. My clinic started out just as a weight loss clinic. But, you know, really quickly we understood weight loss was very secondary to what was happening here. I mean, we were pe seeing people re reverse their metabolic disease, reverse their type 2 diabetes, reverse their metabolic syndrome. And so I went out and said, well, everybody's doing this right <laughs> and what I found was I was ready to hit my head against a brick wall because this wasn't standard of care I mean and I started to get involved and motivated because we can see the huge difference in our patients lives and so a few years ago I jumped from being just a clinician being the medical director of a clinic into being a researcher because I wanted to be part of the solution here um, I spent many years as a primary care physician before doing this and always, I, you know, my family always w remembers, I used to come home and say, I'm part of the problem. I must have written a new prescription for everybody today. Yeah, I and I wanted, to, I wanted to jump into research because I want to be part of the solution for this. And the solution is, again, to take the time with patients, explain to them how the physiology works, help and support them with lifestyle changes, and continue to do more research in this area so that we can understand even more how to make people successful in reversal of their type 2 diabetes. You know, but unfortunately, the healthcare model that is propagated upon practitioners in, in America is not one that is necessarily very inviting to this type of uh, more extended interaction as opposed to a 15 minute uh, quick pop, the patient comes in, uh, I'll adjust your diabetes medication based upon your blood sugar and out the door he or she goes. That's pretty much standard of care, isn't it? It is, and that brings a lot of questions on how do we do this? How do we scale, if you will? right? Healthcare that's based on teaching and lifestyle changes. And so that's part of what our research was about too, is how do you take an idea with this? How do you teach it to many people at once um, and help support them through lifestyle changes? Because one of the things we have to understand is making the lifestyle change is hard. I mean, if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? But it's not. It's something that requires education and time to educate people and then support because you have everybody's different and we yeah. can't take the business traveler and give them the same plan as someone who likes to cook every day in their home lives on the farm uh, but truly i think that the model uh that's pretty ubiquitous uh, or the example is uh, pretty much um if you want to live your life however you choose eat whatever food you want that's going to be okay because we can still get down your a1c by ratcheting up more and more of your medications it's as if you know the the a1c is the patient or the blood sugar is the patient and the end of the day the goal is lowering the a1c or the fasting blood sugar 
And it, it, it so misses the mark for reasons that we've already talked about. And yet this lifestyle intervention and dietary intervention that you're talking about, I guess you were called upon to actually put it to the test. So that's what you did. Right, right. Um, and I agree. I mean, unfortunately, our society has really developed a knee jerk reaction of just write another prescription. Yeah, um, I, and it, we have a son in uh, second year residency, internal medicine. And that's what his training is all about is quick in and out and write the prescription. And, you know, fortunately, he grew up with us. Uh, and he knows there's a different side of the story. So he, he's watching this happen. And I, and I, I think, um, you know, has a, a different reality in the back of his mind. But so you did put it to the test. You did have uh, c conduct a research study. Can you tell us about that? Yes, absolutely. So um, we conducted a, a study and we're actually still in the middle of the study. So the study is a two year study. We are almost a year and a half in and just released our first paper, early results from the study. So let me tell you a little bit about the design of the study. So what we did is we took 500 patients who had either type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome um, plus an A1C of 5.7 or higher. So we could really call them pre-diabetes. 500 patients and we split them into three different groups. So the first group was a control group and that's just treated with our current standard of care, which is going to a diabetic educator and getting educated about a moderate carb, low fat diet. What does moderate then, carb mean? So moderate carb, usually according to the ABA, generally, if you look at the guidelines and what um, patients are counseled on, it's somewhere between 40 and 65 grams of carbohydrates a meal Ooh, and usually okay. more snacks. So okay. I guess you could, in all fairness, that is moderate carbohydrate in comparison to our, what I like to call the SAD diet, standard American diet. Oh, sure. Um, but it's way too high for patients who suffer from diabetes. So, um, and it's more car uh, carbohydrates per meal than we actually have our patients eat in a day. Um, so we took those 400 patients um, care and split those patients into arms. And the first arm of the study, patients were treated in our clinic, what we call live. So they were treated in groups in the clinic environment, like my clinic at Indiana University is. The other 200 patients were treated virtually in the Verda clinic. And that is a telemedicine, essentially. So what we are, the Verta Clinic is teaching people, supporting people all distance, right? So virtually. So can you replicate what's happening live and actually do this in a scalable model? Mm -hmm. So the treatment patients were all treated with carbohydrate restriction and protein goals to try to induce what we call nutritional ketosis. So nutritional ketosis means that someone is actually utilizing fat as their energy source. So ketones, the specific one we're talking about here is something called beta-hydroxybutyrate. And beta-hydroxybutyrate in the blood means that your body is utilizing fat for energy. And if you go back to remember what happens when we have really high levels of insulin, really high levels of insulin mean we're trying to store our fat, not use it. So patients were treated with carbohydrate restriction um, and then again treated in either the live group or the virtual group. And as part of this Verda clinic, they were also given a health coach and physician supervision. And we have our, again, early 70-day results that just came out and it's remarkable. So what we did is what has been, we've been told in the past, isn't possible to happen. We dramatically improved blood sugar control or A1C while reducing medications. So in our patients in 70 days, so this is, I mean, 10 weeks, in 10 weeks, we were able to bring our patients A1C down by an entire percentage point.
1% in our patients with type 2 diabetes. So of those 400 patients, this early paper is just looking at the patients who have type 2 diabetes, which is the majority of them. Mm -hmm. So we were able to bring them down by 1%, but we were doing that as we were decreasing medication. So a lot of our patients, as many are who have uh, type 2 diabetes, on insulin. And of the patients who came into the study on insulin, 87% of them had either a decrease or a complete elimination of their insulin in the first 10 weeks, again, while reducing their A1C by an entire percentage point. It I is mean, absolutely breathtaking. And I am just, uh, just so taken by the fact that uh, we're able to share that with our audience. This is such powerful information. I want to just pick up on the notion of the salubrious uh, kind of events that happen when you are in a mildly ketotic state and you're raising that uh, ketone uh, called beta-hydroxybutyrate. So a lot of good things are happening here, uh, not the least of which is we're actually uh, affecting gene expression. Uh, when you're on that type of diet where your body's burning fat and making these ketone bodies and specifically beta-hydroxybutyrate, you're changing expression of genes that ultimately allows decreased inflammation uh, and uh, ultimately a better metabolism. We call beta-hydroxybutyrate a, I don't mean to be technical, but it's called a histone deacetylase inhibitor. And as such, it's changing the way that your DNA opens up and genes are turned on and genes are turned off uh, for really a positive events. Uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate uh, serves also as a stimulator of certain um, uh, cell receptors on the cell called uh, uh, G proteins, which when they're stimulated have very positive effects as well. So it's more than just changing the fact that your body is now burning fat. You're having these really remarkable changes in that uh, patient's uh, body at a genetic expression level. You are changing their genetic destiny by making these lifestyle changes, that's pretty empowering. It is, I mean, so it is going to be incredibly exciting as new research continues to come out on specifically beta-hydroxybutyrate, again, that's the ketone body we're talking about here, um, and all the things that we may find out that this is really going to be helpful for. I mean, we can see very quickly, obviously in 10 weeks, the major improvement in metabolic disease, specifically type two diabetes. But again, I think that the next few years as research continues to get done in this area, we are just really excited about other things that may be happening. We know, as you just pointed out, it is a potent um, regulator of gene expression. So very exciting things. And, you know, from my perspective, <clears throat> why am I all over this? It's because we've been recommending this type of diet because it's good for the brain. Why is it good for the brain? Because we don't want people to be pre-diabetic and certainly not diabetic. Type 2 diabetes may increase a person's risk for Alzheimer's by as much as fourfold. Uh, cancer, coronary artery disease. I mean, these are other issues that are associated with, with type 2 diabetes. So it's why we can make the broad stroke recommendations, I, I believe, and that is that going lower carb, uh, certainly getting rid of sugar in all of its forms, welcoming healthful fat back to the table, and we should define what that means, is really the broad stroke approach for generally increasing your risks uh, of having good health and downplaying your risk for some really uh, pernicious issues that we don't want to get involved with, uh, like Alzheimer's and, and coronary artery disease, diabetes and cancer for that matter. So, um, you know, you're, you're talking to a crowd who I think is certainly familiar with the paleo movement and many of whom are, are involved with becoming uh, keto, <laughs> getting uh, into somewhat of a the ketogenic state, which, you know, Gary Taubes has told us may very well be pretty much the normal state for humans, you know, since we've been walking this planet. So it seems to me that what you're trying to do is get get physiology back to where it, it has been uh, for a long, long time. So this notion of being a restrictive diet sort of sounds draconian that we're putting you on some, you know, a, a, an altered diet that's unlike something humans should be eating because humans should be eating lots and lots of refined grains and avoid fat. And, you know, we realize 
That is exactly the wrong diet, and that's the diet that really paved the way for this absolute e epidemic that we're experiencing. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, again, going back to a couple of important points that you just made. Number one, restriction, because, again, the idea of a lifestyle change and getting people to stick with it, one of the key things is to make people not feel restricted. And one of the things that we always talk about is not the things you can't have, but all the things you can have, especially when you get away from the idea of constantly worrying about restricting calories. I mean, what we like to say to our patients is when you're hungry, eat. Who knew? When you're not, <laughs> don't, right? I mean, but it's not this, you know, oh my goodness, I, I'm over my calorie limit for the day. You know, that is not part of the equation here. And healthy fats, I'll talk about that really quick too. I think healthy fats are natural fats. So people always say, what is a healthy fat? And I'll say anything that is a whole fat, a real food fat. And that does include some saturated fats. It certainly includes lots of olive oil. Wait a minute, what you just said we should eat saturated fat? I thought horrible things would happen if we ate saturated fat. Yes, unfortunately, horrible things have happened when we've massively avoided saturated fat is what I would argue there. Um, what we actually counsel our patients to avoid is the highly processed vegetable oils and soybean oils. So there's plenty of great sources of whole food fats, and they make wonderful foods. I mean, our patients are not, you know, deprived. I mean, they're eating wonderful whole food uh, meals and they get to eat when they're hungry, not when they can up until some certain, again, calorie limit. And that's Dr. Hubbard, really you, you mentioned something a moment ago that, uh, and, and it was in passing, you said, you know, patients are told that they, they should eat when they are hungry. And I think there's actually some really uh, deep intelligence there because you know, what we find is that the more people become uh, insulin resistant, the less able they are to experience hunger. And I often ask people, well, when was the last time you actually were really hungry? And, you know, in addition to affecting insulin in terms of resistance, we know that as we pursue a higher carb diet and insulin levels go up, that leptin resistance happens as well. And people really begin to lose contact with the notion of being hungry. And what a wonderful motivator to say, when you're hungry, you should eat. And, you know, what is more satiating than a meal with a little good fat in it? Who knew? Right, right, definitely. And again, it goes back to if you aren't feeling deprived all the time, then that becomes a sustainable change. And a sustainable change, as you just mentioned, is what is really going to be key in fighting all the diseases that we now know are associated with insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So, you know, as you mentioned, Alzheimer's disease, we can add cancers to this list. I mean, the list goes on and on, cardiovascular disease, stroke increases of things that we know are very negative and associated with type 2 diabetes. So if we can now start approaching this disease, again, not as a management with more medications, but a solution and a resolution through lifestyle interventions with whole food basis, what we can do is, again, what I like to say is let's bring health back to the table, right? Because we've really gotten into this, and uh, as you earlier pointed out, an epidemic with obesity and type 2 diabetes, and we can do something about it. And I think that it takes support. I, I, I like the solution and the resolution part. I think I'm going to try to own that. Um, yeah. I, I would, aside from our time together today, I really want uh, our viewers to know how they can learn more about everything you're doing. What, how, what, where do we direct people? Absolutely. So um, I would. Uh, uh, the study is going to is going to be up at VertaHealth.com. That is the sponsor of our study. I actually also am the medical director at Verta Health. Um, and so people can read about the study and more about the benefits of carbohydrate restriction. So With I would any encourage luck at all, right there on the bottom of your screen, you're probably seeing right now the, the website to go to. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, VertaHealth.com is going to have an explanation of 
all of what we did, more details about the study. And again, this is just the first paper in the study. We're expecting many more to come out. As I said, early data, 70 days. But what really matters is what happens over the long term. As I said now, I mean, we're a year and a half into the study, and I can tell you that the results continue to be incredibly promising. Um, and I'm very excited, hopefully, to come back sometime in the future, talk about our one-year result and even our two-year results. But again, I really believe that we can change things. We can change things for people. We can help them. We just have to start giving them sensible advice. I think what I'm hearing is that while we did curse the darkness a little bit, we're lighting uh, more than one single candle. So, you know, you're really a beacon out there, really trying to, to get this message out. And I, I really um, just honored that you took your time to share with us today. I do want to have you back uh, at various uh, checkpoints as, these, uh, as the story uh, evolves. And also, uh, I'd like to have uh, some time with you in terms of your take on the whole notion of lipid panels, uh, of what we should be looking for, how do certain parameters that we would see on a lipid panel, for example, relate to cardiovascular ri risk in the real world and what we can do to modify uh, lipids, which I think, you know, obviously you're going to be telling us about, again, lifestyle changes. So let me say on behalf of myself and, and all of our viewers, I, uh, this has been great and we really want to stay uh, abreast of what's going on in your research. So we're going to definitely check back. Well, wonderful. And I want to thank you for all you're doing as well. Because the more people we have who can give people an understanding, again, of why certain things are better instead of just, you know, shaking a finger at them, as unfortunately we have done in the past, and give good, sound lifestyle advice, the better off we're all going to be. It's so thank you very much for having me. You know, it, it, it puts the, uh, the opportunity and the responsibility more on the side of the patient, finally, and we have to accept that that is the way things need to be done as opposed to just the easy way out of take a pill and go on your merry way because your way isn't merry. And I also want to say that you know, this, this notion of being restrictive, I'd say, yes, we're going to be restrictive and restrict you from getting Alzheimer's, uh, a below the knee amputation and renal failure. That's what we're going to restrict you from if you stay with the program. So, you know, it, it, a little sweat equity here is going to go a long way. So thanks for joining us today. I hope we get to talk soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Bye-bye for now. So I think it was uh, pretty obvious that I really enjoyed that interview. What a fund of knowledge, uh, terrific information for all of us, not just as it relates to diabetes, but when you connect diabetes with so many other pernicious diseases, uh, then it really becomes so important for us to understand how important our lifestyle choices really are, especially uh, as we look at the balance of, of protein, uh, carbohydrates, and fat in the diet. What a terrific guest. I really enjoyed chatting with her today. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. We'll see you soon.